Good morning. Good morning. I welcome all of you to St. Matthew's. And I'm so glad to see you all and your bright faces. And also, I'd like to extend my welcome to those of you joining us uh, from Facebook and Zoom. So it's a glorious day. And shall we all stand, if you're able, for the call to worship? God's light has come to reveal the way in this new year. Arise and shine, for our light has come. God's light penetrates the darkness that covers the world. The glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Let all nations come to worship the King of glory. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. The opening hymn. 249. concerns. Please keep the Mohit family in your prayers. Fatima's brother-in-law was killed in a car accident last week, leaving her young sister a widow with a very small baby. So please keep the family in your prayers. We are also requesting prayers for Donna Starkey and her family. Her mother is in the hospital with COVID and other medical concerns. So please keep the Starkey family in your prayers. 
and we are requesting prayers for Dennis Beerfield, Rodman's father. He was diagnosed, diagnosed with small cell lung cancer on Thursday. He began treatment with radiation therapy and chemotherapy to stop the spread they discovered. So please keep Dennis in your prayers and Rod and his family as well. We are also asking for prayers for the family of Carol Marion who passed away last night and she is the aunt of Jay McGonigal. So please keep the family in your prayers. And we are also asking for prayers for Grace Scholey. A happy birthday to Ray Arakajan today. Happy birthday. And Carl and Margie Pekella have a new great-granddaughter, Emma, Emma Ann, born on January 3rd. Congratulations. Thank you. With all this joy and concern in our heart, shall we bow heads and pray. Lord, a bright and abiding light, you have shown us in the person of Jesus, your son, a new way to live. You have poured your light into the world and have asked us to live in the light rather than run and hide in the darkness of doubt and despair. You promise to be our light all of our days and ask us to place our trust in you. The journey in this light is risky. It means that we will have to be very serious about our service to you, giving you our best and offering hope and light to others. In this new year, we bring to you the names and situations of others for whom light seems to be a stranger. They struggle with illness, economic hardship, broken and damaged relationships, loss of loved ones, and anxiety. Gracious God, we place them in your care. Let your light shine on them, bringing healing and hope. Gracious God, as we pause for a moment in our silent prayers, hear all our supplications. Gracious God, we know you always answer our prayers. At times, it may not be matched with our expectation. But in the end, we know you already answered our prayers. So help us to be bearers of the light in all that we do. For we ask this in Jesus' name. And the people of the church say, Amen. Shall we say, shall we pray the Lord's Prayer? Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now we came to the order in our uh, worship to recognize our outgoing and incoming leaders. So instead of asking you all to come out, so I'm going to invite you to stand where you are. And uh, this is only those who finished their uh, duty as of end of last year, and also those people who come after them as a new capacity. So let me just read the names of outgoing leaders first. Oh, by the way, have you received a uh, 
list of leaders in the church for New Year? Yet? Not yet? It's in the narthex, so please make sure that you take one. Uh, my, why don't I limit to one copy for one family? In that way, we can share. These are the outgoing leaders. Lisa Wilson. Is she here? Oh, yeah. She was at Council Chair. And Pat Clark. All right. Pat was the financial secretary. Jackie Gerard, chair of the trustees. Peggy Price. She's not here, but she is the head of, I mean, a head of education department and also a member of SPRC. Debbie Pearson, she is a member, she was a member of SPRC. Bob Leshy, he was a member of the nomination committee. Dick Baker and Jean Baker. All right, back there. Uh, they both were a member at trustees. And Jane Thessens, she was membership secretary. All right, shall we give them a uh, applause? <laughs> Let us quickly pray. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and we are so grateful for their dedication and their commitment and their service to your church. We know that you've been blessed them through leadership and commitment. And we are so grateful of them for their service to your kingdom. So even though they successfully finished their duty, we ask you to continue to bless them through various ministry in your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now it is incoming leaders. Chuck Hastings he is a new chairperson of Ad Council. Lisa Wilson, <laughs> she is a new financial secretary. Rod Burfield, he is a new treasurer. Scott Lee, he is going to be new chair of trustees after the trustees uh, voted on uh, voted and approved him in the first meeting. <laughs> but I guess that I have a suspicion that it's internally already done. And Pat Layfield, she's a new membership secretary. George Huffman is a uh, incoming uh, member of SPRC. Victor. Ogbana is a new SPRC member. And Erin Burfield, new member of nomination. Deanna Leshy, she's also a new member of nomination committee. Jim Whitman is also a new member of the nomination committee. And Ed Smith, he's not here, but Smith family is there. <coughs> Ed is a new member of trustees. Deb Marshall, I don't think she is here, but she is also a new member at uh, trustees. Mary Adams, I don't think she is here either, but she is also um, rotating on again as a trustees. Angela Cockrell, new board member of EEC. And Erin uh, Burfield, again, she is a member, I mean, she is a vice chair of a worship committee. All right, would you welcome all of these new members, please? <laughs> Let us pray one more time. Almighty God, pour out your blessing upon these, your servants, who have been given particular ministries in your church. Grant them grace to give themselves wholeheartedly in your service. Keep before them the example of our Lord, who did not think first of himself, but gave himself for us all. Let them share his ministry and consecration 
that they may enter into his joy. Guide them in their work. Reward their faithfulness with the knowledge that through them your purposes are accomplished. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And also I'd, I'd like to just commend all of those remaining existing leaders in our church. Thank you all. And now if you are able, would you all stand for the hymn before the scripture, 237. <laughs> This whole reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to, to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ 
Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access in boldness and confidence through faith in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Please stand as you're able for the gospel acclamation and remain standing for the reading of the gospel. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it's been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there, ahead of them, went the star that they had sent, seen in the east until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and bade him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for, for their own country by another road. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Yes, 
the children join me, please? That is a big star. So this week we celebrate Epiphany, the time when the wise men followed the light of the star and the whole world suddenly knew that God was present with us on earth. As you know, the wise men, also called Magi, followed a star to find Jesus. God had given them the star to guide them and led them right to Jesus. When they found him, they gave him gifts and bowed down and worshipped him. Today. I thought we would follow a star, because you know, wise people follow stars. We're following the star to places that we see God. The Magi saw a star, followed it, and saw Jesus. So let's take a few minutes to think of places we see God here, or experience God here in church. Are we ready? Let's go. Come on, let's go. Let's go over here. And a little birdie told me that is tomorrow someone's birthday? Is it your birthday tomorrow, JW? I think so. <laughs> oh, wow. early happy birthday. So what is this called? Up here. Brick. <laughs> Good. Marla? Well, if you're in a past six. Right, it's called the pulpit. Oh. Here, we hear about God. We hear about the... Christ's child, the love of God. God is present here, isn't he? Yeah. How about over at the altar? Shall we walk to the altar and follow the star? The communion altar. Do you think we see God here? Yeah. We do, where we have bread and juice for communion. Here we experience the love of God. The grace and love of God is found here. Christ is present here. How about over there? What is this called? Rylan? Yes, the baptismal font. Is Christ here? Yes. Yes. He is. Here is the water that the Spirit is infused. In the Word, as the water is poured over our heads, and as we remember our baptism, as God is claiming us as His children, we find Christ here in his gift and in this sacrament. Come on, let's follow the star. Whew, God is everywhere, isn't he? Oh, how about here at the piano or the organ with the organ pipes? Do we see God here? <laughs> we do. God is here. He's here in the words we sing. The music played so beautifully. The sound of the bells when they play. We hear the spirit, don't we? God is present here. What about when the choir is singing? Is God present? God, yes, he is. God's created and called us to sing, to praise him in song, to help us pray and to help us proclaim. God is present here. Hmm. Oh, wait, wait, wait. This just in. Yeah, yeah, yes, okay. Oh, okay, oh, oh, he said one more place. We are to follow the star one more place. Here. Is God present here? Yeah. Rylan? Yes. He is. God told us that when more, one or two or more are gathered in his name, that he will be here. God is present here. When we are gathered, he is present with us. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for being present, for loving us, for giving your only son. Help us to remember that you were always present, always with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's follow the star to our classroom, the children's church. 
Thank you, choir. Always wonderful. This Pendrelli chorus. So today is Epiphany Sunday. We said it that way. And in the story that we just read, there are a few characters in the story from the gospel. So the three members of Jesus' family, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus himself, Herod, the king, a Magi. Well, we usually know that there are three Magi, but the Bible never talks about the three or ten, but simply there are three gifts presented to Jesus. People guess there are three Magi, three wise men, but it may not be true. But we are so familiar with this story. We just literally can memorize and tell whole story. But what kind of message can you get from this passage? Well, I just tell them briefly. So first, God's wisdom 
outsmart humans. This story is about Herod versus God. So Herod called the Magi secretly and found it the exact time the star had appeared from them. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. We all know it's true. I mean, it's not true, right? Second thing we can learn from that is God's protection and God's guidance upon God's people. Always. Our reading also said, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they, Magi, returned to their country by another route. There's another example of God's guidance upon God's son's family. Later, Joseph was also warned by God to flee to Egypt. Third point is mystery of God's work. Who would know the Messiah was born in a small town called Bethlehem, not in Jerusalem, the holy city. Also our scripture says, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherds of my people Israel. Did you know that the Gospel of Mark was the most Jewish of the four Gospels? Matthew, the writer of the Gospel, consistently, tirelessly quotes the Hebrew scriptures to demonstrate or prove to his readers that Jesus is the Messiah. The fulfillment of the ancient prophecy and the hope of Israel. What if you think a little more? Isn't it odd then that Matthew opens his account of this very Jewish Messiah by telling us that the insider, the one who had the scriptures, studied day and night, those who were the recipients of all the promises of God, however, missed the arrival of the Christ child and did not know anything about it. And a bunch of outsiders, Gentiles, who knew not the first thing about the ancient prophecy or the wrong race, the wrong color, maybe, the wrong religion, couldn't even pronounce Emmanuel, much less tell you what it means. Visited the infant Jesus and worshipped him. I think certainly God has a humor. Anytime a child enters the scene, you can count on one thing. There will be a disruption in the normal order of things. Some of you are grandparents, and soon I will be one too. And during the holidays, you have had small children visiting your home. If not, then you have at least been in somebody's home when children were present. And you know that there is a great deal of confusion, a big variation from the normal routine when children are there. Children are not very orderly. Orderliness is not something that ranks high on their priority list. That's what makes them so much fun to be around. In fact, candlelit dinners and civilized conversation where ideas are followed through to logical conclusions are virtually impossible. <laughs> if children are there, Maybe rather the food are flying over the table and spill something. 
bumping into something and crying, making a noise and chase each other. Some folks, therefore, have an automatic negative response to children. I don't think that's what happened with the King Herod. His response was much more severe than simply being disgruntled by an annoying child. Herod responded in rage and anger. He certainly tried to kill the baby infant Jesus. Why do you suppose he reacted that way? Well, put yourself in Herod's place, in his shoes. If you're living large and in charge and news came to you that a baby had been born, who'd someday challenge your authority, threaten your way of life, shake up the status quo, wouldn't you get a little bent out of shape? Ask any teenager how upset parents get when their authority is challenged. When those of us who are charged with responsibility to create and maintain a sense of order feel threatened, it's not a pretty sight. Throughout history, <coughs> kings have had sensitive noses for snooping around, snooping out anyone who might challenge their authority at some future time. They have even mothered sons and daughters, fathers and mothers, if those people gained too much power over others. In Herod's case, it was not the fact that a child had been born that presented the problem. The threat Herod reacted to was the possibility of a future conflict. What's the expression? Nip at the bug? What would happen when the child grew up with this kind of popularity, this kind of expectation, anticipation? That's what worried Herod. He could see trouble down the road. So he acted accordingly, preemptively, and he attempted to eliminate the problem before it became a real problem. He responded like people in positions of power, all too frequently respond. Herod was so concerned with the preservation of the status quo that he was even willing to slaughter innocent children to accomplish his goal. 2,000 years later, not much has changed in that regard. The King Herod of our days still seek to maintain power by threatening to kill those who openly oppose them, even if it means killing millions of innocent children and adults. I think that's what happened in Russia, Ukraine, any parts of the world throughout the history. Frighten the king or frighten the leader will not hesitate to pull the trigger or push the button. A few million people, innocent lives are of no consequence when it comes to protecting the glory of their empire. This child, Herod, sought to kill Herod has cause to fear him, to want him out of the way. As it turned out, he will bring a new ethic, a new way of doing things to a world enamored with, murdered down in the old ways. He will say, turn the other cheek when somebody hits you or slap you. And go the second mile if somebody asks you to help. Give good when you get evil. 
All those saying is so opposite of this secular wisdom. All the heralds of history will not understand him, I mean Jesus, or what he teaches. And his message comes to us in the quiet inner voices, which speak of peace and nonviolence. And our world is so steeped in violence, so ready to prove we are right because we can hit harder than anyone else cannot hear or understand what he is about or has to say. Jesus and his messengers still summon us to a way of living the world do not understand. And we must decide whom we shall hear and whom we shall follow. Shall we trust the voices of the world's heralds? Shall we give our over, shall we give over our conscience to those who tell us that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is the only ethic possible? Shall we heed those voices which demand that if we hope to survive, we'll hit back twice as hard as we are hit? Or Shall we listen to another voice that tells us that for some things, the most important questions of life and death, Herod cannot be trusted? Perhaps wise men and women will hear that other voice that calls them to the back roads of life, roads that leads to peace and peace on earth and goodwill among the world's people. To paraphrase Henry David Thoreau, if a man or woman does not keep pace with their companions, perhaps it is because they hear the voice of a different angel. Let them step to the music which they hear, no matter how measured or far away. Tell me what you hear and who you are willing to follow. Tell me what you trust, what ethic, what world view, what system. Most of us, most of your neighbors will hear that martial music that justifies the letting of innocent blood when the cause seems right. But there will be a few, one or two, here and there, who will hear another voice. That comes to them in a dream, a dream of a peaceful world, and will step in time to the beat of that drum. The safety and survival of the world depends, now as it always has, on those who hear and respond to that quieter voice, no matter how measured or far away. On this epiphany, we have seen the child we heard the story. What voice are we willing to listen and follow? Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for sending your Son to us. We are so unwilling to hear your message, to hear your voice, but turn our ears to something else. But Lord, guide us through, protect us, give us wisdom so we can hear and listen to your voice. Rather small, than the loud voices in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> and now, as we prepare our tithes and offerings, shall we pray one more time? 
Your word is made flesh and dwells among us, O God, full of grace and truth. For the gift and all that you bestow, we say Alleluia and Amen. As we behold your glory, we commit ourselves to Christ's work. Make of us the body of Christ and dwell in us by your Spirit for the sake of the world that you love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh. 
There are a few announcements that I'd like to share with you. A fundraiser for United Methodist Women, now it is called United Women in Faith, a Super Bowl soup tasting on Sunday, January 22nd. Orders will be taken at the time for pickup on February 12th. So keep that date in your mind. And also another one is, please join the Arthur Guild after the service as they take down the Christmas decorations. And uh, Adult Sunday School will join the forces in taking down all these beautiful uh, decorations. So uh, please don't go to room 127 or something, but you gather here. And there is coffee hour. And those of you who like to enjoy coffee, you are coffee thirsty, you can go ahead and straight to the fellowship hall. But those of you who like to join us for, take down the decoration for Christmas and Advent, you can join us. Now, shall we all stand for the closing hymn? That is 254.
Here's the benediction. The light of the star, the light of God's love, shines before you as you live this place. Go in peace, go in joy, go in love to meet God's people in the world and greet them with the good news of salvation. Amen. Amen. Amen.